Okay, <laughs> it being six o'clock, based on the bell across the street, um, call our meeting to order on uh, April the 10th, 2024. And just for those who, who may not know, today is the, uh, is the celebration of the end of Ramadan, and we will not have uh, Sarah here tonight as a result of that. Um, and so, we can move on. Um, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. So after the um, Pledge of Allegiance, uh, we have approval of minutes, town moderator debriefing after annual town meeting, super and re uh, superintendent's report, assistant superintendent, and I think although we don't see her here yet, she will be here later for a presentation that's part of um, the agenda, and that's the finance committee, excuse me, the finance and operations report. <clears throat> the school committee member reports citizens request the fiscal 24 budget update, uh, voted town meeting article, capital article update, acceptance of a donation, uh, the uh, Assabet Valley uh, Collaborative annual report discussion and accepts fiscal year 24 third quarter report. Uh, at the end of that will be adjournment. So uh, first thing then is approval of minutes. Is there a motion? I'd like to move to approve the minutes from March 27th. Is there a second? I'll second. Very good, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Four zero zero, thank you. Hey young man, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> not so young, but not that. You say that. Hey. <laughs> so anyway, thanks for uh, seeing me early tonight. Uh, before I start, I just wanna give a plug for, uh, as you probably know, this was a quite an interesting town meeting season. Got a lot of new people. A lot of people were interested in ins and outs, and there was a lot more nuance to the town meeting. So um, I had taken a break from doing it during COVID, um, but now that COVID is receded and given the interest and uh, the number of newcomers and the people who are delving into the details of town meeting uh, more, um, I'm, ho I'm hosting a series of drop-in office hours over at Memorial Hall at Town Hall, uh, including tonight from 7 to 8.30, tomorrow from 1 to 2.30 in the afternoon, and from Friday from 10 to 11.30. So I figure a morning, afternoon, and an evening slot each an hour and a half. No formal agenda. I, I ask residents or voters who want to give their feedback of what they thought about town meeting, how it could be better. If they didn't go, what would make them go? Anything that they think might help the uh, our self-governance run better. Uh, it's just a drop-in. People can say what they want. Um, I've promised to the select board and the, and the advisory finance committee that I'll report back on what I hear um, after I give, get some structure. And I just wanted to give a plug for that for anyone watching tonight. So thanks for seeing me early in your meeting so I can get over and unlock town hall and do that. Um, so as you know, uh, we had our town meeting on March 23rd. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of a recap. Uh, looking at the draft of the town meeting minutes that I'm reviewing um, that the town clerk has sent me, in the course of the day, we had 683 people check in and get voting devices, which is just under 5% of the voters, which is, which for uh, a, uh, anything short of the lights at the high school or the library edition is certainly amongst the, the highest of the, of the consistent uh, turnouts that we've had. And I was pleased to see that throughout the day, we were consistently getting between four or 500 people voting. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, that was sort of a silver lining to a very busy day. Um, just to compare it uh, to the election that was held a few weeks before, um, uh, the, this draft report I had uh, says that there were, um, that uh, there are thir as of March 2nd, the day uh, uh, voting registration closed for the town election and the town meeting. Um, there were 13,745 uh, registered voters in town. Um, so the town election uh, drew 2,872, uh, which is about 20.8%, and our town meeting uh, had just under 5% checking in. So, um, so I was pleased with that. I was, I was uh, glad that the voters were able to stick through a long day um, and for the most part, uh, uh, keep it very respectful. Um, and I was very grateful that we were able to finish the town meeting in one session. Because yeah. uh, if you had asked me around 2.30 on Saturday afternoon, I was thought for sure we were gonna be Tuesday night. Yeah. Um, so uh, 
So I'll, I'll thank for the, uh, I'll thank everyone involved, not only the extensive school staff that helps, Steve Ashley, Steve Mascherelli, Amber, everybody. There, it takes a lot of people to set up the town meeting to have it run smoothly, and I'll give extra, extra bonus credit to everyone who went through earlier and many uh, pre-town meeting discussions and meetings with me to make sure that we thought about as many possible, um, you know, options of what could happen and how to do it as possible. So uh, I want to thank you, obviously, for that. So I'm mostly here to get your feedback. I've made it a tradition to go to the Finance Committee, the Select Board, and the Fis Advisory Finance Committee um, after every town meeting just to give uh, sort of the, the major boards in town uh, a chance to give me feedback, though any of you or anyone watching is welcome to, uh, to go to any of the sessions in the next three days, or if you see this after that, you can send me email at moderator at westboroma.gov, and I'll, I'll add that to the feedback that I'm gathering. So with that said, I'll open it up to you. Well, uh, I was very interested in, in the methodology used for the, uh, for the end articles and uh, was thinking about that and, and actually, uh, you know, as a fact that the replay happened, I guess, a number of times on television, I was able to actually compare your seven and a half minutes each side mm -hmm. to what the average of every article turned out mm -hmm. to be, which is exactly 15 minutes yeah. uh, on average. Oh, so obviously, sure, some ran more and some ran less. So. Yeah. I think that worked out very well. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm not here to either defend or to, to pat myself on the back, but I want to say, um, I, I don't know, the select board and I got the brunt of emails of people who were very concerned about the fact that there were a number of citizens' petitions, you know, all, uh, essentially almost a quarter or a third of the warrant was that, and I know there were concerned people thinking like, oh, it's going to, you know, we're going to spend way too much time, and so I know I came to, um, to, I think I came to the select board and the finance uh, in the finance committee. I think I even came here, uh, but it was been a it was been a very busy week. Um, and I think the proposal to to limit debate for those kept people's attention focused. It let people from both sides say what they want to say. And as I said, sort of before in my little my little mini lecture between the, the second to last and the, the last uh, article, um, I think it was a very unique opportunity to take some very uh, highly emotional issues in a room of about 400 people. Everybody managed to speak their case, and as, as is the role of town meeting, we came, we spoke, we voted, and uh, I think we held the town together, and, and that, was, that was my main goal, as it is with every town meeting, is to make us feel everybody gets heard, everybody gets to vote, and then we let the votes fall where they may, so. The only thing I would suggest is that if after each side had their first chance, mm -hmm to allow uh, anyone who wished to make a motion to uh, uh, end debate, because I think some of it went on longer than it might have if, mm -hmm. that, was, if that rule was in place. Yeah. Well, the, the, I'll just tell you, the rationale for that is that my belief is that the, as a legislative body, and, and I was asked this, uh, if not at the meeting, before the meeting, like, why can't we just hear the motion and then go directly to vote on it. My, my philosophy of town meeting is that the town meeting is deliberately set up as a deliberatively a de deliberative body. Apologize for using the word deliberate twice in there. Um, and so I didn't think it was, I, I thought that by having the, the motion that I presented earlier as a rule of the meeting to limit debate to 15 minutes with seven and a half minutes per side, it would be adequate to essentially say, if we can just keep it to that, and that way it was most, uh, most of that, and, and I think what we noticed was uh, by the time we'd been through probably nine or ten of them, someone finally made the statement to say, if we don't have much else to say and want to vote, we can just not raise our hands and want to speak. I don't think it's my role to encourage the voters not to speak if they want to, because I don't want to be encouraged, uh, anyone to think that I'm taking sides, and so I didn't think it would be appropriate to have a motion to terminate debate either after the main motion or the first um, the first speaker, because in many cases, the first speaker had the people, just as they do for presentations, they tell me in advance that they'd like to make a presentation. And I thought that the voters that didn't have that opportunity should be given a, an opportunity to speak. But um, but we live and learn. I'll take that into, under consideration. Yeah, I'm, I'm just um, suggesting, you know, when each side has had their yeah. chance, you know, whether it's the second time or the third yeah. time, whatever. Right. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Know, Make, yes, make perhaps if, if we've exhausted one side of people who want to speak, then maybe it would be appropriate to, yeah. to allow that. So yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll certainly think about that. That's a, it's a good point that once one side's ex exhausted the people who want to speak, maybe there is no need to hear more from the, the side that does want to speak. So thanks. That's a good observation.
I have a few questions. So first of all, I thought the, the meeting went very well, uh, considering the number of articles. And I thought it was a good idea, I don't know uh, where it originated, to have some of the presentation not be shown unless there was a discussion. Uh, we did that. 20 years ago. Uh, that was yeah, a good idea. Yeah. I thought it's, that was. It's, it's an evolutionary thing where I think other people just say, like, let's just put, tell your little story, and then if there isn't a need, and I, I think especially with the DPW thing, sometimes those are so dense and yes. so much in there. Yes. But yeah. But thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I like that. Uh, so I, I had a lot of conversations with different uh, residents, and, and most people were most, you know, were emotional about the citizen petition. So I, I have a few questions. Can, uh, the, so is, is it the case that the minimum number of, of signatures required to, to include an article as a citizen petition is only number, only 10 votes? Uh, for an annual town meeting, the state law says 10 votes. For a special town meeting that the select board is already calling, it's 100 votes. And 200 voters can make the select board have a town meeting whether the select board wants to or not. Um, so that's what the state law says in terms of the town meeting. Now, what's come up is that I've had conversations uh, with the select board with this, and one of the select board members has, a, has approached um, uh, one of the, uh, our state senator to do some research into this. And based on an email I got yesterday that, that, we're, that I'm going to follow up on, and I'm sure they will too, there seem to be some towns that have been able to get a, a, essentially a bylaw to change that. Um, and I don't know, I mean, my understanding was that, that without going through a whole home rule petition, you know, very lengthy process that, you, that the town's bylaws couldn't override state law. But this particular early email in the, in the, in the chain uh, of asking questions seemed to indicate that maybe two or three towns have done that. So I was going to follow up on that to see, and I think the select board is going to be following up as well. Um, okay. Yeah. I think that would be that would be great if we increase it. I mean, in this case, if we increased it to 30 signatures, I think yeah. that could have been enough. Yeah, I think what I heard is that at least one town, and I don't want to say what it is in case I'm remembering wrong because I don't have it right on my laptop with me. I think at least one town made it 50 signatures, which is the same as you need to get your name on a Correct. ballot. But again, I don't I don't know exactly what the process was, but but I'm going to look okay. into that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, or an, another idea we, uh, uh, that I had was, can we bundle petitions uh, that are uh, originating from the yeah, same this, author? Yeah, this question was asked beforehand. I think it was actually asked at the meeting as well. So there were, there were people who said, like, given that we have, you know, like 13 non-binding petitions, can, can we do them um, like we do with some of the capital where we have A, B, C, D, and E? And my response to that was, first of all, A, the petitions are, were actually all signed by different people. It was a lot of overlap, but not all the same. And then even the select board felt that they had the authority to bundle them. They're not all exactly on the same topic. So I feel that for me to handle it fairly, I would have done it as we do with capital, say A, B, C, D, and E, and like the budget and people questioned them. Right. And I felt relatively assured that even if we did that, they, each one would have been questioned and we would have wasted five or 10 minutes of yeah. me reading through each one yeah. only to have them each questioned. Yeah. So it was a judgment call that I felt that even if I, even if I felt structurally or procedurally we could do that, it was unclear to me that it would actually save time, and I decided to, to just go with the basis of once we'd established the, the 15 minutes, seven and a half minute aside ground rule, and I would just see how it went, and, and I think it went okay, but, I, uh, but there's, no, there's no permanent fixed way we're gonna do these things. Yes. I'm gonna continue to think about what worked, what didn't work, and I'm always trying to make it better, so. I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised you really thought about all these questions many times, but maybe some, somebody else will benefit from listening to the answers as well. Uh, so last question would be, mm -hmm. can, uh, can we request that these citizen petitions are actionable? That there is actually, you know, that there is... That there's something the town meeting needs to take action on? Right. Yeah, that was something that the, the select board had to, at a meeting that, that I was at. The select board actually... Um, uh, when the select board was going to close, I think it was the night they closed the warrant, they had town council on. And town council's opinion at the time was that because this, the wording of the statute is that for a town meeting, once you get the number of signatures, it can put subjects on the warrant. It just says subjects. It doesn't say anything about subjects for which the town has authority to act. At the time, the town council thought that, that it would not be appropriate for the select board to 
to not put them on the warrant. So um, again, we're all learning. Uh, I think everybody's gonna find, if, are there other precedents? Are there other towns that do it differently or why not? Um, and again, at the end of the day, I'm just thankful that although there were a number of them, although they were highly charged and highly emotional, um, I was very proud Some of the well. fact that 400 plus voters sat and listened and voted um, and didn't turn into a circus that many people had told me for sure they were positive it was going to be. <laughs> I agree. And, I, and I was very thankful to ev yes. everyone for making sure that wasn't the case. So worst case, people may have spe spent two extra hours in the high school auditorium that they didn't want to, but at the end of the day, I think it certainly was a success based on what it could have been. I agree 100%. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Okay, that's all for me. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have any questions. I, I would like to applaud you for handling well a, a very charged town meeting. Um, you know, I went into it not knowing really what to expect, but I, I think your decision to limit the debate to seven and a half minutes per side was a wise one. Mm -hmm. And I was one of the ones who asked about uh, whether or not a motion could be passed to vote on the citizens' mm -hmm. petitions mm -hmm. um, oh, that's right. as a block. Yeah. Um, and y you know, your answer is what you gave here, that you know, they're very distinct articles. And so yeah. I, I, you know, I think that's the right decision yeah. that, that you made. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, so kudos. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, as you, uh, regardless of citizens' petitions or not, it's always a balancing act. My job is to essentially be the chief parliamentarian and to help the voters figure out how to navigate a legislative process for which hardly anyone has lots of expertise at. And so I'm always trying to, sometimes I err on the side of, of helping the voters do much, sometimes I, I err maybe the other way, but I'm always trying to at least explain why we're doing it the way we are. I try to have sessions like this to give feedback and, and the feedback has led to changes. We start, we have the traffic light, you know, this year, you know, we did, did that, so, um, so, so thanks. And, and, yeah. And I always do try to understand my, I, I always do try to understand my rationale even if people think it's wrong because a few days later somebody might say like, oh, you know, I thought about that some more and here's this. It's, and there, many times there's things I didn't think about. So, thanks. Speaking of the traffic light in yeah. the mirror. Yeah, okay. I'm not sure if many people used it. One or two people did, but I'm gonna keep I, I trying. I never noticed it when I, was, when I was speaking from yeah. the podium because, you know, I mean, you're delivering to, yeah. the, to, the, to yeah. the hall. Yeah. And so um, I, I guess to the extent it could be Put up on uh, you know on the podium itself or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep working on it. It was it was an idea that I think worked for. It was a good for, idea. It's just it was it worked for a few people. It. But as you say, when you're in when you're in the midst of public speaking, which many of us don't really enjoy, um, <laughs> remembering to look for it. And I was actually trying to figure out how can I angle it so people of various heights and where they stand might see it. I'm going to keep working on it. So <laughs> that's good. Tim. Um, my questions were already addressed. Um, I would just like to say I thought that the citizens' petitions were handled incredibly well. Um, I do appreciate all the thought and work that goes into town meeting. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you for your service to the community. Thanks. I was gonna say, John, I think the traffic light was effective. I do think getting a second one, if it isn't too complex, would be helpful and it could go you know, somewhere that they can see it. But mm -hmm. um, usually, you know, maybe, Maybe Mark could cue the person and just you give him a red, yellow, yeah. green. Yeah, maybe because he he's watch, right yeah. there. He just holds. Yeah, I guess up if he red. had red, yellow, and green like cards that him, he could hold just up. Just give yeah. him three uh -huh. little circles, and he can hold it up when the light changes, and they'll see it. Yeah, okay, that's a good idea. You know, yeah. keep it simple because yeah. then you don't mm -hmm. have to coordinate two different mm -hmm. timed yeah. things. So yeah. uh, I, I like that. I thought one of the changes that was interesting that took a little time to iron out was your selection to not to only have certain people people at the podium, and. Um, I, I'm still reflecting on that, and I think it, it was effective, and I have to think about playing out the, the different types of presenters, and I wonder if we want to provide maybe a standing mic where they could be over yeah, to right, the yeah. side, mm -hmm. you know, not, yeah. because you, if you're looking at their presentation, but we force them to the back, although a couple of them came down, you know, I want to be respectful to the fact that they've presented an article, whether I agree with it or not, and yeah. that they need to be able to speak in a way where they can present well. Right. Yeah, and so yeah. I think there were some awkward moments for those people as they were trying to figure out where they were going to present from. And whoever it's going to be in the future, it might be good to establish, you know, a chair and a mic there where they could come down and sit and it's... Yeah then a respect to the presentation. Yeah, yeah, that um, was something that I hadn't announced in advance. I just it was what part of my own thinking and I, yeah. I never really talked about it. And then I, I, I'm yeah. also reflecting on it, how to make it better too. Because yeah. I do agree, the, the ability to make eye contact and to see the room makes a big difference. Yes. And so I think having some way for 
for a sort of an official, this is, this is the government speaking and then some of the voters to do it, but both down front, but still maintain that subtle, though I think what I've been told in other towns is a best practice, that subtle but important un, sort of visual of like who's speaking now. Is right. it somebody who's, who's a, a voter or legislator or is it somebody representing a body? And so, yeah, that's a good point about having a, an extra standing mic, um, my on the fly, just telling people they could take the, the holding mic and stand down there, but yeah, right, keep working right. on that. But I think that, you know, again, you always do a good job to just reflect on it, refine it, so I think there's something to be done there, and I think there's, you know, something that would be cleaner, and okay. I, I think it's good. Mm -hmm. um, I agreed on the timing for the non-binding positions to keep them framed well, and I think we always struggle a little bit with the heavily dominant voices of people who want to present over and over and over mm -hmm. again. And I think you managed it as allowable and, and um, kept track well mm -hmm. over a long town meeting. So I thought that that was really well done. Um, I don't think you've got much more you have to refine. I mean, I think we've established a stronger babysitting model. I think that's done yeah. more smoothly. Yeah. Um, I like the way we ironed that. I think the lunch addition has helped people. Mm -hmm. So um, I do think my one thing is if you are gonna do those um, open sessions, if you email those to my assistant, okay. we'll push it out to all the families okay. I mean, because yeah. you'll reach a lot of people that oh, okay. you're hosting right. those. So I think they're valuable and I think the opportunity for people well, to it's a little learn. too late for the one tonight, but there are Thursday and Friday, so I'll try you to mail it. it. To me and we'll, I'll yeah. send it to you tonight and you can send it. Push and it out and see if you get some whatever families. Whatever the backpack. So in the future, the whenever you're trying to do something for town business, okay. if you send it to the superintendent's okay. assistant, they'll okay. push that for you. Oh, okay, thank you. I appreciate you're that. You're welcome. Um, and you know, Westboro Connects will also post that for you, mm -hmm. and you can put a blurb about training people for town meeting. And it, that I think their re, their current readership is very high. Mm -hmm. So both of those forms yep. will help you reach the great. community. Thank you. So I thought it was great. Thank you. And and, and and thank you also for the we. I think you started superintendent when I first got elected. Yeah, ten so years. So I, I think yeah. I think you and I started at about the same time. Yeah. So it's been a fun ten years, and uh, yeah. enjoy your next adventure. Yeah. Thank you. Daniel? Um, everything has already been said that I would have said. Allie, nice to see you again. Did you did you get to go or watch any of the town meetings? I did not. I was, okay. It's my first town meeting where I could vote, but I got stuck in Toronto. So oh, it's good. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, if you watch it on TV and see how it goes, I'm curious to know how a new voter uh, sort of absorbs the whole thing. So. Thank you very much. I remember much. my first time, too. And of course, yeah. I, was, I was brave enough that I sat in the third row and asked questions. And, Police Chief Gordon, I think, has forgiven me for asking my question. We did have young people there. It was really good. Yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, very good. Thank you. All right. Anything else? Thank well, you thank you. Much. Well, thanks again. Thank you for coming. Yep. See you next time. Okay. The next uh, item on the agenda is Superintendent's Report. Thank you. Um, so uh, we are heading into vacation week. I just want to note that um, as of Friday, it will be the end of school for students for the week ahead. Um, after we return from April break, there is always um, an energy and intensity shift as people can see the close of the year. And for teachers, it tends to be, you know, the, the next couple weeks of framing all the things they need to cover and finish between now and the close of the year. We had a very stable winter, which feels really good. I think teachers felt that they were able to cover content effectively with, uh, without too many interruptions, and the rhythm of the year has continued to be very, very productive. Um, I feel gratified for that. It's always good for students and families, as well as for faculty. They are gonna get a week to relax and regroup, and then we come back and we're spring right down to the close. It's then a quick eight weeks to graduation, Hallie will graduate and we'll bring a new member on board. So it's gonna be a very busy, busy spring. Um, tonight, what I wanted to do was just speak briefly about, for the record, um, I shared with you, hello. I shared with you uh, a letter to our representatives, our state representatives, regarding a request that they continue to carefully review the funding formula and the allocations shared for Westboro. Um, I think it's a, a supportive letter and they, the select board voted to support it and Christy Williams, the town manager, asked that I bring it before you and that um, the chair discuss um, 
your interest in signing it as well, because I think it speaks to Chapter 70 funding and the request that they continue to make sure that Westboro is getting a strong fair share allocation. Um, and so I encourage you to sign it. Um, I will sign it and I created um, a signature page if you vote to, to participate in that. Select Board have approved it. They're waiting for your signature and we would send them in in partnership. Um, so I would turn it over to the chair for any discussion and see if, um, if there isn't too much, we would move to sign that and give our lending support to the Select Board's letter. I believe every member of the school committee has had a chance to read this letter. And as a result, I would uh, suggest and make a motion that we uh, approve on behalf of uh, <clears throat> Christy Williams the, that, in fact, the uh, school committee supports uh, her letter. Uh, and uh, as a result of a potential positive vote that we sign the document to support that. Is there a motion? I, I move that we, uh, on behalf of Christy Williams, that we support the letter that she's presented us. Second. I second. Uh, any discussion? <clears throat> Short and sweet. All those in favor? Aye. Right. Four zero zero. Perfect. I will say that. So, if you pass that around for signatures, that will be helpful. Um, I saw, I'm trying to see if I can find it. I saw a good news, state budget news. Um, the House Ways and Means Committee just released its budget proposal and the House has proposed 190 million for school lunch meals for all moving forward. That is actually 20 million more than Governor Healy had proposed. I think that's very interesting. So um, I think the sustaining of the school lunch free school lunch for all has had very positive effects across districts. And um, I, it's good to see that level of support. So maybe they're feeling as strongly towards the other aspect of the budget and we wanna get the, uh, the, the things in soon. So that is good news as well. And that is my report for tonight. Daniel. Um, just a quick report uh, about <clears throat> Monday and the, the eclipse. And, and I, you may not know that we provided um, the, the, the glasses for all the students. Uh, some, of, some of the parent groups did it at a few buildings, but we made sure that all the students had them. It was a, <clears throat> it was a, a you know, much anticipated day everywhere in the country, as you, as you know. And so um, it, we talked about it in, in the classroom and, and you know, it, explained what was going on, but as you know, the eclipse itself was happening after dismissal. But we wanted to make sure that everyone knew how to be safe and we put out communication to the parents. And um, so we um, we enjoyed the day just like uh, It was know, fun. I got else. this really cute video from two fails teachers and they had on these headbands and one was the sun and one was the moon and they were basically enacting like how the moon was gonna go in front of the sun. And it was just these very cute little spontaneous, energizing, positive and really enjoyable um, celebrations. So that was really good. That's it. Need them. Just in time, right nothing, huh? Yeah, nothing right <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> I, I have a couple of things I'd like to, to ask of the superintendent and one is uh, we've seen on the news these days that, in fact, the kid taking the MCAS had his uh, computer, uh, in effect, explode while he was taking the test. And I'm sure that people out there are wondering about what our, how our system works and what we, uh, how we deal with uh, potential issues like that. Amber? Sure. So um, it, the tech team is very strong, and they have a regular rotation where we collect all of our laptops and the ones that fall into the range of um, the ones that we lend across district, they check and rotate them regularly. They swap out batteries for new ones as needed. If, if there's any faulty indication on uh, any of our computers, we pull them immediately. We also have a protocol where if you have, and this has occurred in the past, one at Gibbons, where a computer started smoking when somebody stuck a paper clip in one of the outlets. So there's a protocol that we've developed where you know there's an immediate call to the office, the teacher clears the room, and we collect that 
computer and attend to it. Um, it goes outside immediately, and then we basically return the computer to the company with a with an explanation and an assessment. So we have had, you know, I think two experiences in my time here where a laptop smoked, one student-induced and one, um, I don't know if it was or not, student-induced has been so long. But we do have a very nice emergency protocol for it, um, but it really is about the care, rotation, and checking of all your laptops, and that is done regularly in the summer work session, um, and I feel like we have a very healthy and safe um, protocol, both if something happened and um, for our regular checking and maintenance. Very good. I'm sure that's uh, reassuring to every parent out there with uh, um, a child that has one of these things. Um, the second question that I have and request uh, comes from the selectmen's meeting last night uh, in regards to the proposal for development of additional residences in town which will be under the um, uh, auspices of the planning board, and eventually I guess we will also um, get to see the plans and comment. But my point in bringing this up is that um, one of the things, of course, with residential development is how many children will it produce uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the school system? And secondarily, um, you know, whether or not the statistics that are being used by the planning board in reviewing it are um, actually our experience in Westboro. So what I will ask is that we try to create, uh, because I think we have the data, um, um, how many students are, are being generated in the various types of residences in town, and that um, that information be provided to the planning board for their use in how they evaluate the project. So, um, I interacted with a select board member who called me with questions wondering if I knew of the development. I do get, so that development is a discussion taking place for over at Home Goods, that stretch of the section um, where Home Goods was all the way down that whole mall area um, to create 130 dwelling units there one and two bedroom apartments, um, condos, apartments, I'm not sure which it is, might be a combination. Uh, I think, and also a percentage, I think 20 or 25 percent affordable. Um, you know, that aside, I explained to the select board member that it was not in our current count, and at the time when we did our enrollment study 10 years ago, it's held up exceptionally well for us. It has tracked out almost, you know, as we anticipated, um, but that was not carried in it. Um, we had carried the development of houses that went out by Grafton where they brought that um, development in, out, out, actually out by you, um, was counted in the original, but this is not. Either the, also there's another small development over off of Otis, I think some micro houses that they're looking at doing, and those are not counted. So given both of those, Mr. Durrett, I believe that the proper action would probably be to organize another enrollment study. I don't know that we need the extension of what we did the first time when we formed a committee and did the study, but we need to do an impact study of potential housing again and make sure that the formula is holding. And I think we used, wasn't it like 1.5 kids per unit? It might have been 2.5 because they were heavy. I'll pull the report and look, but I, I think the actionable items would be to set up a working meeting with the planning board and refresh them on the structure of the memory of it and discuss possibly even a joint one. I mean, I think we need to be very careful that they are assessing that because 130 units, those kids are going to dump right into the system. and. You also then add in addition to that the concerns around just the increase related to the shelter-based housing, which is also not counted, and has brought in, I think, 44 kids. Um, you know, it starts to impact where we are. So um, why don't you and I have an independent session on that and bring back an actual item and look at the research you and I did before. We can pull that report, maybe review it the enrollment study and see the piece we would want to do 
and whether or not we would want to work to request one. I mean, NEASC does them for free. Well, minimal cost. So we should talk about it and maybe come back or request a meeting with the planning board. That's fine. Yeah, I, I just want us to, that is the school committee, to provide any data that we have that would be useful in this evaluation. I think we should put together a memo, we could put together a memo indicating to the planning board that we want to flag that this was not carried in the enrollment study when we built. And I think we need to look, again, like it's, we need to look at capacity for getting work done. We can name what has to be done, we have to look at capacity for accomplishing it. We're moving to the close of the year. But you need to look at a classroom study of how much space we have for build out and, our, and we don't have much. So. It is, it is certainly, it involves a composite of work. It's not staggering, but there is a smart composite that we did the first time. I don't know that we would ask for proposals for, con, you know, for construction. I think we would just do the school assessment of space and the formula for the town assessment of, of what's possible. Um, I will review it, but maybe you and I have a meeting. We decide what we do. Yeah, that's fine. As, as long as, uh, you know, the school committee uh, and school system participates in this evaluation. I think it's important for the town to recognize that we also have input to such things, particularly if it turns out to be that we need uh, more space or that the impact of it is increased um, uh, population in each grade uh, in a classroom. It's gonna be more and, staffing. Yeah, and staffing. And again, staffing is proportional to the needs of a community. So. You know, if you bring in 100 kids, you know, 15 or 16 percent of them are going to be special education, 20 to 25 percent of them are going to have L needs. Like there's, they, they, they frame statistically, so all of those require increased service. Um, you know, we've been in a quiet phase in terms of staffing growth. That feels like how we felt, you know, in 2017 and 18 where we were every year building forward, both physically building and structurally bringing in new people. Um, I think that there's a conversation, it's not ours to have, but certainly to participate in, that the planning board needs to be asked what their long, what their larger, what their larger vision is, or the select board, we need to look at the master plan, like were we looking to continue to increase housing in the town? Because you're then also increasing traffic you're increasing all the demands of police and fire and just the congestion of the community. And you know that site. You can imagine 100 plus residents coming in and out of that every day onto Lyman Street um, is, is certainly an interesting proposal. And there are many communities that also then set limitations. And I'm always curious why they set some limitations that we aren't in, you know, either choose not to. I'm not sure what our, I mean, you've sat on the planning board, so you know, but. Um, so it's an interesting time to see it circle back after 10 years. Um, and I think the town should be cautious. So. I could ask a question. Yeah. Sure. If, if these units were built, uh, would, would these kids be going to Hastings? We would have to redistrict. Yeah, we'd have to spread it out in whatever resources we have. We would have to do a redistricting. So we carried redistricting in the um, strategic plan when we were putting fails in and made the decision that fails out with growth was going to happen with the, with the new development that came in that opened through Grafton, as well as the fact that um, we were spreading shelter residents around and that they had the Mount Pleasant build out, which um, the development off of Mount Pleasant, which is gonna end up being like 27 houses, I think, and that's two kids per house is the average you use. So, Fails is gonna be full. <laughs> so we built Fails with two additional classrooms, I think two or four. I have to look back at the study. Um, I'm just closing out and not having to think about that. So opening it up is really hard for me. Um, but I do think before, you know, I step away because I have a lot of the history on that, we should maybe sit down and organize a memo from the school committee to the select board and to the planning board regarding the caution of their building profiles. No, no, none. Jim? 
Uh, no comments at this time. No, I would, I would support what you suggest. We could s sit down together, discuss what we know and what we need to know, and where do we get the information? So. Right. We know the mechanism of what we have to do. It's a collaborative, focused, written, documented move forward, and we have to put it in print. We can't just talk about it. We got to get it in a memo. We got to go speak to them and get on their agenda. And that's how we mobilized before with clarity. And we did the joint, we did a joint uh, enrollment assessment where we had planning board and select board and school committee together, shared document. And I think we should request a shared process because then abstractly somehow like we own that enrollment like we were asking for it. So if you're at a joint process and you've got a select board member and um, the town manager and the planning board director, everybody has to own this building they're doing. So. Very good. All right. We'll just do, I'll jot a little timeline and start to think about what we would need to accomplish, Steve, to leave it in solid footing uh, moving into, you know, the end of the year. Excellent. Next item on the agenda is uh, school committee member reports. Jim? Uh, nothing to report at this time. Thank you. No. Um, so the spring sports are in full gear. We're having track meets, lacrosse games, baseball games. It's all, we've had multiple matches this whole week. And Best Buddies is hosting an inclusion week at the high school to talk about um, the importance of inclusion. Good. Jakub? Uh, no updates necessarily. I just want to say thank you to, uh, on behalf of my children for uh, for the schools to to distribute those those, those glasses for the solar eclipse. I thought <laughs> it was it was brilliant. I was actually stuck behind the bus on, uh, when, uh, when when the kids were uh, going home, and I watched probably ten kids um, get off the bus, and as soon as they got off, immediately look up in the sky. And just, I mean, you could tell they were so excited to you know. To use it, then my own kids at home were using it. I thought it was it was great uh, because th this was an event that was nationwide, you know, well, nationwide um, for sure. It was broadcasted, so th they felt connected to that in a, in a way. So I thought it was great. Thank you. I have nothing to report tonight, and uh, I've already done my thing, so we'll move on. <laughs> um, the next uh, discussion is citizens' requests. Do we have any takers? Okay, would you please re read our rules? Before we begin, we will remind everyone of the school committee's policy regarding citizens' requests. You must be a current resident of Westboro. Speakers are allowed to address the school committee about issues within the school committee's purview. Each speaker will be allowed up to three minutes to speak to the school committee. Written comments longer than three minutes may be presented to the presiding chair before or after the meeting. You're welcome to hand the chair additional comments in writing now or send them via email and the chair will share them with the other school committee members. Public comment by residents at this meeting is not a discussion, debate, or dialogue between individuals and the school committee. It is an individual's opportunity to express an opinion on issues within the school committee's authority. Our role is to listen carefully to what you have to share with us tonight. Clapping, cheering, calling out, or any other noise during or following a speaker is not allowed. At the close of citizens' requests, school administrators may address what was shared by the speakers if they wish to do so. And remember to state your full name and uh, street address and speak directly into the microphone. <coughs> Great. Uh, I'm Joe Considine. I'm 10 Smith Street. I am following up on the return on investment analysis on the million spent a few years ago for solar panels and geothermal heating at Fales as part of the new building project. Uh, that Stephen uh, prepared at my request. It is very relevant to compare the net costs and benefits of this option versus the prior option without these additional features. I object to your use of a net present value over 50 years for this analysis, as that is dependent on the accuracy of the cost data 50 years from the opening of the school. Do you really think you can accurately estimate the price of electricity 50 years from now? A better metric is break even point. That's the number of years for the town to recoup the upfront investment of this option. Using the data you supplied me, this comes out to 27 years from when the school is open or year 2048. 
if the towns had multiple green projects to consider, each of which had a break-even point of two or three years and had to choose between them, NPV over five or 10 years uh, may be helpful, but not 50 years. Ignoring the break-even point and instead using the 50-year NPV metric as you did at town meeting is at the very least confusing to the voters and perhaps worse. I argue as a concerned citizen that this was not a wise investment and hope that our town leaders will not bring forward such expensive but largely symbolic projects in the future. I am, favor, I am in favor of green projects with a break-even point of two or three years, but not 27. Remember, the alternative could have been to buy mostly green power from National Grid. I come here today because I was moved by the voter who spoke at town meeting of people having to move out of Westboro because our taxes have gone up much faster than our neighboring towns over the past few years. I am concerned that uh, about, uh, I'm concerned by voters who are relying on our food pantry, including some former middle class because they can't afford groceries. Food pantry customers are up 85% from last year. Our taxes are now 14% higher than Southboro which is not a poor town, and 28% higher than Shrewsbury. My conscience won't allow me to remain quiet. If you consider electric school buses or other green projects, I ask that you use an ROI analysis with break-even point and not a 50-year NPV to evaluate those projects in the future. I kindly ask that if you're going to refute my analysis in this meeting, that I be given a chance for a short rebuttal. Thank you so much. Well, I think I'll say this. First of all, when you have a project and you know the cost, you can do a net present value. Since the state told us that the school's uh, viability is 50 years, it's a 50-year life. What you suggest for decisions going forward is ROI. And ROI is a proper use of comparing what you know of different options. They aren't the same, they're totally different. And in fact, if, if one has, um, you know, let's say five different options to consider and you have the data that you have in each option, option uh, a return on uh, investment is in fact the proper analysis. When a project is done, uh, the um, net present value tells you what you think the project was worth after the decision was made from what you chose. And therefore, uh, I... Um, Net present value analysis is correct. In finality, you might forget that in fact all this information was presented to the town meeting uh, whenever it was, 2017 I think. And the town meeting was given these options and in fact there was a report which you have seen uh, of, the, of the ROI that was done by our, our engineer at the time. Besides that, the town has the information associated with the benefits of a geothermal system which is installed at Hastings. And over the years it has proved out to be the same. Now you've made this statement a number of times and I think as far as any presentation going forward about what your will is, uh, present it to the people that decide, which is not us, it's the town meeting. And that's where it should lie. So you're welcome to make any argument you like to the people that decide how to spend money. Thank you. So you're saying a 50-year NPV is more valid than a, than a break-even point that says 27 years. I want to, you go on record for that. Well, what I really want to say is that you realize that our, our bonds, excuse me, that we have to pay off last 20 years. And in fact, until you pay those bonds off, you, you will not get a payback, positive payback. I think you're continuing to confuse the voters. Thank you very much. So this will be the last time I'll speak on this issue. Town meeting, I think, decided. Okay, what's next? Mr. Chair, we're moving forward. Um, the budget update tonight and an update on town warrant articles and our progress since the vote. So Anita is joining us and together she and I, she's carrying the weight of it. She's gonna walk you through the current um, drawdown on our budget and give you information moving towards appropriate close of FY24. 
Thank you. Hello, everyone. This must be everyone's favorite time to talk about money and budget, see how we are at <laughs> this time of year. Um, we are approximately 11 weeks out um, for the end of the fiscal year, and we're looking that we are in very good shape. Um, although we closely monitor the budget throughout the year, after April break is really the real start um, of when we start to do the end of year budget work for the finance office. So this is when we're gonna really start to get busy. Um, looking at the um, accounts going down, number one, going through payroll, um, we had approximated around $800,000 shortfall. So we're looking a little slightly better than that. Um, and that was for, there was um, contracts that were not completed. Um, Prior to the budget vote. Yeah. Correct, last fiscal year. Um, the six schools, um, we have, um, we gave them a target amount to hold back on their spending, and we are on track for doing that as well if you go down those. There are, um, for technology, fine arts, curriculum, those accounts are slightly in the deficit due to just simple like cost of software and goods. And for fine arts in particular, um, we did um, replace two aging instruments recently, which was around $6,500, $6,600. They're very expensive. They are really expensive. The $40,000 um, surplus that is, um, is within district-wide. We have a school lunch account that is appropriated $40,000. That's for any expenditures that are not um, able to be made out of the um, school lunch revolving account. And these days, you can basically pay the majority of everything out of the hot lunch account, so we haven't even touched that money yet, and we, we're not yeah. anticipating using that money either. Yeah, so we held that this year so that we could put it against the deficit. In other years, we have used it effectively to pay for the beginning of the year luncheon for faculty, which is you know an important part of that. Some of the, um, we host the milestone ceremony, like those are appropriate to come out of there if we are hosting um, an event, so some, some of those. And then we also carry that to pay off some of the deficits at some of the years maybe in the school lunch account. So you remember that the state changed the funding mechanism for free lunch, I mean before free lunch a couple of years ago where we had to pay the deficit off at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we established holding that amount. So this year we held it, not sure what they would do with um, free lunch if we were gonna end up picking up the deficit because there are still some deficits in the accounts beyond the free lunch. So that's what that's used for. This year we kind of froze it so we could use it to help us offset the deficit. Back to you. Okay. 400,000 within special education, that is the 400,000 that is appropriated for um, tuition costs that are um, unanticipated. So we're holding on to that right now. Um, circuit breaker, we, had one, we have $1.8 million. We have utilized 484,000 and another 400,000 is um, encumbered in a PO. So we will have another 974,000 that we plan on transferring in to the general fund at the end of the fiscal year. Um, transportation services, right now we, um, we are showing a surplus, but that's only because we're still negotiating our invoices for regular transportation. Um, we are still going back and forth between our transportation company and our legal counsel. So that's still ongoing. And then within our facilities line, um, currently we are holding on to POs for utilities. We normally don't decrease any POs for utilities until we get all of the winter invoices, which should come out in the next couple weeks, and then we'll be decreasing those amounts as well. So right now it's showing we have a negative 25,000. I'm very happy that it's not any more than that. We are doing very well at this very time. After looking at 10 years of budgets, um, you know, I think this one is running tight as we, <laughs> as we knew it would. Um, I just want to, you know, again, the, the, the salary deficit we've called out, we knew we were going to see that. You can kind of see it there transparently, but we've managed to carve out the offsets. And I think that the facilities I'd like, I'd like their mid-year track to be tighter than it is. They encumber a lot of funds for contracts like like 
like sawmill for, for all the landscape work. They have a lot of fuel encumbered utilities. And last year, those were running so high, they upped those encumbrances. But um, I've asked Anita just that we continue to make sure that we can pull down those accounts in quarterly. So, I mean, they just think it's a pain to have to go back and open another PO, but we just wanna pace their budget aligning a little more tightly to what we're actually giving them. Um, so I think this rides out well. I know that by the time we close out encumbrances, we'll be fine. So I open it up to discussion and questions. So far, so good, I guess. Yeah. Anybody have comments? Okay, okay. very good. <coughs> um, so the, the next item on the agenda is uh, the articles, positive votes on the articles uh, uh, for capital improvements um, uh, are underway, and I asked uh, Anita to comment on what's going on with them and, um, you know, when... Uh, when we think we'll be able to move forward. Yep. So right now we are working with our attorney on contract language for the Hastings roof project and our Hastings um, ADA project. Um, we should have the contracts done within the next week or two, and then I will forward them to you for review and for signature. Um, also for OPM services, um, we did narrow down and we have, um, we, are, we chose one vendor. Um, we are going through um, a walkthrough with them next Wednesday um, during the day um, at the school and then we'll be ready to sign as well. Um, it's going to be one OPM to look over both the projects. I didn't understand you were able to pick that, um, that company off of the state uh uh, bid process so that we don't have to develop all kinds of paperwork. Correct. Correct. Yes. I think it's also very advantageous that we've been able to have one OPM for both projects in coordination because the ADA one will scope over two years. Um, and Kelly's done a really good job to get that accomplished. And I think, and I think she even said she had the contract back as of tonight on the Hastings roof. So you know, we're, we're, we're moving along quickly, and then the ADA one, like she said, we're expecting, which feels really good. So when we look at just the Hastings project as a package, OPM almost there, one OPM for both, contract completed on the roof and the ADA coming. So pretty good, pretty good pacing for getting those projects started. High school roof designs, um, right now we're just awaiting proposal from um, for the cost of the three designs from GGD Consulting Engineers. We're hoping to get that back soon. And last, our Mill Pond roof restoration was passed over at town meeting. I think it'll be important to pull that forward for next year. It'll be in the capital notes, and that's one of the advantages of the way we're tracking now. And I think you'll be able to make a decision if that comes in next year, if the high school roof comes in the following year. You guys are just gonna have to continue to pace it out. Um, you know, if we end up having to deal with more enrollment crisis, you know, this kind of stuff starts getting shoved to the side. So I think we just have to really focus on getting um, these done and moved forward. I think we're in pretty good shape. And remember, the high school roof, we, when we figure out the design costs there, it's three different projects. So um, by the time we put that out to bid, it'll be interesting to see the way that works, but the design can be done by one, so it should be good. Thank you. As you Thank all, you. members of the school committee, uh, recall uh, Amber's notes for our meeting tonight, following up on the discussion we had at the last meeting in regards to having a, 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 a internal committee to, uh, in effect, review and respond to the needs of, of these projects. Um, Amber had a list of uh, candidates, uh, and I. I would certainly um, want to serve on that committee, which means that we would then have one open slot for a member of the committee. Uh, and I think at the end of the last meeting, both Tim and Yakub had an interest. Um, and so uh, obviously either one of you would be a great um, addition to the committee. Um, how would you like to resolve this? I think I have fewer assignments. If you okay, I'll I'll I would uh, 
move to this subcommittee. Uh, I'd be happy to be on the subcommittee, but I am uh, okay with that. So yes, yeah, yeah, two of you would like to serve. Yeah, just to remind everybody, the reason why we only have two members of the school committee on any internal or external committee is that three would be a quorum. And so any decision or discussion that would be had at any of these meetings and, and therefore be uh, potentially created in minutes uh, would be binding. And so that's the only, that's the reason why we only have two on any of the um, committees or assignments that we have. And so, so, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, if you have two of you and Anita um, to help track funding, this follows the package of really what, what was formulated at town meeting. This is more a um, oversight committee. Um, and so uh, Julia Degadish, when she returns from maternity leave, should sit on that. Kelly G. Capello, Superintendent Allison Borsch, Borsch's, and probably rotate in the head custodian as needed because they're often the people on the ground first thing in the morning and all the work people are kind of connecting through them. And so I think to discuss that, um, to figure out how to do that, I'll t we can talk with Kelly and figure out the balance of that. But I, I think that would be a workable committee for you. I agree. And so uh, to the extent that we need a vote for this, I don't know that we do, but uh, all those in favor of the membership, you can vote too. You did. <laughs> All right, four Perfect. zero zero. So we're Perfect. good to go on that. All right. Um, the next you. item on the agenda are the two collaboratives, ABC and Accept. Okay. Okay. Um, actually, okay. Th there's that, and then the acceptance of donation. Can we back up one? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, I wanted to uh, bring to you a donation, a grant that was made. Um, let me just open it up here. Sorry, I just have to get it open myself. Um, Mark Vidrich Foundation, and they at different times have offered um, grant support. And the Levi has, Levi, our uh, interim, uh, our acting athletic director, uh, has stayed in relationship with this group, and they very generously, we asked for, I think, 1,000, and they very generously approved 2,500, a grant of $2,500, which will generously cover the support of our unified track. Um, and that's just really nice news to see, especially the week where this week we're doing inclusion kind of support this week. It's really great to see um, the type of support that we get from these different organizations. So I would ask that you approve the grant reception of $2,500 from Mark Fitterich Foundation for the support of the um, unified track. Your motion? Yeah, so moved. And I would like the, uh, uh, the motion to include the language of uh, with the uh, um, gratitude from the school committee for, for their uh, grant and uh, gift. Is there a second? I will second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor. Just, just Thank that you. Way. That's really Thank a nice, you. nice to get. <laughs> I'll use my last <laughs> next time. <laughs> <laughs> so the vote is 4 zero, zero. Thank you. Um, now we can talk about the collaboratives. We can. Um, so we are members of two vibrant collaboratives that cover different aspects of our region. And um, I shared with you Aspet Valley's annual report as an update to the work they're doing. And I think it's nice, um, typically you peruse those independently so that we can just acknowledge that we've received them and that you feel update on the, updated on the work of the collaborative. Um, it's interesting because I believe it's important to have them on the public record. Some, I was talking to some colleagues who forward it kind of for review, but don't include a moment to speak about it. And I think, you know, the collaboratives serve us. I think it's good for the community to understand how they work. Um, they provide a range of services. We're, we're in contract with ABC for our van services of transportation of special needs students. And we're in some shared contracts for purchase of um, block purchasing of paper 
where we get a very, very advantageous price in working with them in bulk and some other types of things that they provide. So I just uh, want to acknowledge AVC. They have successfully opened the upstairs room that they were renovating, which has really curtailed programming for them. And they are now returning to very robust booking of their professional development space. And it feels very good to see them turn the corner and their revenues are picking up again. So AVC, I think, is in very good place heading into the spring. I think you're going to see them continue to host some really strong PD for the collaborative. And I think there's good things ahead for them. Um, I will be rotating off. I'm currently vice chair there. Uh, and they will have the new superintendent folded in to serve for Westboro. I would also speak about the um, accept third quarter report, which I also shared with you, and it's interesting to see the differences, how they present their information. Um, I would want to track except for a while and pay attention because, you know, I feel like you know Aspet Valley Collaborative after all these years. Except is new. They're going to offer different things. You'll probably hear Daniel bringing forward some of the, the stuff that they're doing because I think they're providing some really good programming for students with special needs who need some special additional supports at times as well as programs and good PD. So the job alikes there are really um, well attended by, by some of our staff. Sherry attends our job alike. So some good things ahead. Um, so I guess I would ask you just to um, acknowledge that we have um, seen and received these two reports. Any questions, comments? Um, just as a point of information, do the collaboratives ever offer um, their comments and considerations to the state legislature for the programs that they operate? They definitely do the same type of lobby work for um, interaction with the state legislature for special consideration of grants, support, expansion. The rules for collaboratives are very different, which is really interesting. And so um, some of the funding sources, like they don't get Chapter 70, like it's different. So um, those are the types of things where what they're lobbying for, but they do play a strong role of bringing the voice of multiple districts forward and do play, do play a kind of a political component role for the districts. That was exactly the reason why I asked that question. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. obviously in numbers we can have an influence um, relative to school and the programs that, uh, that the two collaboratives yeah, and I, it was interesting because for a while there's there's been a move by the state and it was after EDCO failed, the collaborative of EDCO failed, that the state was looking like it might try to standardize a lot of the collaborative's practices. And the collaboratives appropriately at a certain point pushed back and said, well, that doesn't make us collaboratives and we're supposed to be independent operational bodies and they do have unique differences as well they should. And so they're in partnership with the state, but the state started organizing them and there was some discussion. It was collaborative. I just want to be on record as saying, but it was brought about a really healthy decision about where they're independent and then how they can have a different voice. So there's, there's like a unique thing about being part of a, a collaborative that is good for you to understand. So. We host our retreat there sometimes. It's a nice spot to go because it's close. And so I encourage you next year to consider an early retreat. And I think Allison and I have already talked about a time, and I should get confirm it with her and get that to you. But we actually looked at a September retreat time or an early October. I urged her to move it a little closer because with her newness, I think it would be good for you guys to have some team building and discussion time. So. Um, I'm looking at that with her and her transition, and I'll send it to you, Steve, and then we'll share it to the committees so you can kind of lock in the date. Yeah, I think that would be a, a good opportunity for us to have, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one discussions with the school committee members as well as with our new superintendent. Yep. Uh, and also to get her feeling of, uh, of how things are going, if you will, in the, the weeks, uh, months plus uh, that she's here. So I think that's very good. Okay. Um, I will work with her on that. Making some notes. Don't let me forget, Daniel. I won't. All right. Um, I think with that, our agenda is complete. Any discussions that anybody would like to put on the table before we adjourn? If not, uh, whoever would like to make a motion? I move to adjourn. Is there a second? I will second. Those in favor. So you guys have to enjoy that this was a short meeting because next 
next meeting is longer. Yeah. So prep yourself, bring a snack and a glass of water. Um, we will have a little bit longer meeting. We'll have two update reports. We don't typically, but um, one of them would have been tonight, but couldn't be. So I try to keep the meetings. So we've got like one, I think we'll st I'll work on shuffling things so it's not too long, but two nice reports coming forward to you, um, Director of Student Service and the wellness report. So it'll be a nice, nice evening full of content. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Westboro TV. Thank you.